From April 6th to early July 1994, in the small Central African nation of Rwanda, between 700,000 and 1.3 million people were murdered in one of the worst genocides in modern history. In those three months, around 70% of the Tutsi minority were massacred, with three to five times the number of people dying each day as were killed in the Holocaust of World War II. 200,000 people were killed in the first two weeks alone. And what makes the Rwandan genocide particularly horrible? is that this speed was not accomplished by gas chambers or armies or even by bombs or bullets. No, the vast majority of Tutsis were beaten to death with clubs or hacked to death with machetes. And quite often, their killers called for them by name because most people were murdered by their friends, co-workers, neighbors, people they knew and had lived with for years. As one survivor of the genocide recounts, before, I knew that a man could kill another man because it happens all the time. Now I know that even the person with whom you've shared food or with whom you've slept, even he can kill you with no trouble. The closest neighbor can turn out to be the most horrible. An evil person can kill you with his teeth. That is what I have learned since the genocide. And my eyes no longer gaze the same on the face of the world. So how could society break down to such a point where neighbors gave up three months of work and ordinary people decided every day to kill their fellow countrymen? Something was seriously lacking. And before anyone says, well, they needed Jesus, let me just point out that if any place on earth had Jesus, it was Rwanda. Before the genocide, Rwanda was one of the great Christian missionary success stories. Between 90 and 95% of the population were professing Christians. And we don't get to write them off just because they killed people either. They read their Bibles, prayed, and attended church. They went to revivals, listened to preachers on the radio. They believed the creeds, professed their faith. They were Christian. And for three months, they diligently worked to completely exterminate fellow believers and countrymen. Many of the worst massacres actually happened in churches as people fled there to be safe and were butchered there instead. For a religion founded on a man who gave his life for everyone else, who taught to turn the other cheek and to love your neighbor, this was a horrible departure from his teachings. How could their faith not mitigate or prevent this genocide? What led this nation to murder? Well, for the next several weeks, I will be looking at all of the steps that caused genocide itself, as well as what broke down in their faith that allowed this genocide to happen, and finally, how Rwanda has taken some really amazing steps to move beyond this genocide and somehow to begin finding forgiveness. But let's talk about what happened first. Modern Rwanda is the most densely populated African country, with around 7 million people in it before the genocide. It's composed of three main groups. Uh, the Hutu compose around 85% of the population, the Tutsi around 14%, and the Twa, a uh, reclusive, mostly forest-dwelling pygmy people, at just 1% of the population. It's hard to sort propaganda from fact in the early history of Rwanda, but the Twa were definitely the original inhabitants of the country. At some point, Bantu tribespeople migrated into the land, and Hutu propaganda from the 1950s onward say that these were only the Hutu, and the Tutsi people were later interlopers, not true Rwandans. However, genetically, the Hutu and Tutsi are pretty much identical. In fact, it doesn't appear that originally they were different people at all. Rather, Hutu and Tutsi were different social standings within the same tribe. 
So a Tutsi was a wealthy person, someone who owned more than 10 head of cattle, while the Hutu were the poorer farmers without enough wealth to buy cattle. So a well-to-do Hutu could become a Tutsi by becoming more prosperous. When Europeans arrived in 1884, Germans in this case, they saw the Tutsi as a ruling class of superior people who were generally paler from being able to stay inside more, taller from better nutrition, and were obviously in charge. I, the king was a Tutsi. He had money. The rulers were Tutsis. They had money, so they were, by definition, Tutsis. The Germans, however, saw what was an economic distinction as evidence of their own racist ideals, and they assumed that the taller, paler, wealthier Tutsis must be a different race with some superior European blood in them. And so they separated the people into two groups giving more power and prestige to the already wealthy Tutsi. Though some other people also became considered Tutsi due to looking just a little taller or more European. After World War I, Rwanda was given to Belgium, and in 1935, they issued identity cards to every person in Rwanda, cards that identified someone as Hutu or Tutsi. Suddenly, upward mobility was impossible because the rich had now been permanently labeled as rich and better, while the poor were designated poor for all generations. I, the resentment was intense, but Hutu and Tutsi still lived side by side, intermixed throughout the population, marrying each other and generally getting along, much like the rich and poor do in small towns all over the world. When Rwanda achieved its independence in 1962, they immediately voted in a Hutu government because the Hutu were the vast majority. At this point, separate tribes or not, they believed themselves to be different. And that was enough. Their identities had been driven home for enough decades that the terms Hutu and Tutsi defined their lives. After almost a century of oppression by the wealthy, some Hutu celebrated independence by attacking their old oppressors. The killings were sporadic, but dangerous in 1963 and 64, and some Tutsi fled into neighboring countries, particularly Uganda, where they began a rebel Tutsi group, the RPF. Now, this group had limited success, but was always a thorn in Rwanda's side, and whenever they did well, some more reprisal killings happened, particularly in 1973. Now, these attacks were carried out only by the most radical of Hutu power fanatics, but the entire nation was saturated with anti-Tutsi rhetoric and anger. While Hutu and power were now getting very rich, and the Tutsi were mostly removed from power, the rhetoric was firmly established that the Tutsi were the cause of all the problems facing the nation, and they needed to be eliminated. No differentiation was made for Tutsis in the rebel army versus people's neighbors. Hutus were told that the Tutsi wanted to kill them all, that the Tutsi were preparing to invade, preparing a massacre, that the Tutsi were the enemy, they were spies, they were not true Rwandans. They were told that they were not even truly human. Instead, the Tutsi were called cockroaches, and calls to stamp them out became so common that it was fodder for jokes in popular comedy shows of the day. And yet, until the killings themselves, few people took this extreme language seriously. If anyone was called out on it, they just said the language was metaphorical, or that they just meant the Tutsi rebels, of course, the bad Tutsis, not all of them, only the fringe, took any of it seriously. But the language of the stamping out these vermin, this cockroaches, this filth, it just saturated Rwandan culture. Like, like a conspiracy theory that no one really believes, but everyone knows and jokes about. And all this time, Tutsi and Hutu continued to live, work, and worship together. 
marrying each other, and in nearly every other way be fully integrated into society together. In 1990, the rebel Tutsi force, the RPF, began a serious push once again, forcing the Rwandan government to include a few other political parties in a share of power, something that eventually resulted in a peace treaty in November of 1993, one that would share power between Hutu and Tutsi. The conservative Hutu party that had been in power for so long was losing its death grip on power, until that is, April 6, 1994, when the helicopter carrying the presidents of Rwanda and Burundi was shot down on their way home from signing that same peace treaty. No one to this day knows which side shot it down, but it was the justification that the Hutu extremists needed to maintain power. And that night, the killings began. The moderate Hutu prime minister was one of the first killed, along with the 10 Belgium UN troops guarding her. Other moderates were killed or fled the country, and the government became filled with Hutu extremists, who proclaimed loudly that their desire was to restore peace, all the while quietly arming the extremist militias uh, called the Inner Hamwe and encouraging the genocide. And that killing of UN troops was carefully calculated to scare off all of the foreigners. And it worked. Within a week, only one American was left in the entire country, and almost every other foreigner was gone as well. The media was gone, the embassies were emptied, and the international community sent no more troops, no real condemnation. It kept silent as the government claimed that this was all just a civil war while still encouraging the murder of hundreds of thousands of people. Claudine Kayatesi, a survivor of the Netarama massacre where 5,000 people died in a church compound, said whites do not want to see what they cannot believe. And they could not believe a genocide because that is a killing that overwhelms everyone, them as much as the others. The international community certainly showed that there is some truth to that. The world was overwhelmed and could not believe that this was actually happening. So they chose to believe that it wasn't. Meanwhile, the radios began calling for all Hutu to avenge their president, saying that there had been discovered stashes of Tutsi armaments meant to kill all of the Hutu, and that to protect themselves, all Tutsis must be killed, because they were all spies and enemy, and they would all join the rebel Tutsis unless they were stopped. Fanatical inner Hamwe militia roamed the country, rousing people to kill and arming them with machetes, forcing the local population to join the hunt. Some joined willingly, but most were unenthusiastic at first, many joining simply so that they too were not killed as Tutsi sympathizers, or to save the lives of their Tutsi spouse and children. Men, women, children, friends, family, co-workers, all were hunted down and hacked to death or bound and thrown into the river. And they kept after this, day after day. People left their houses in the morning, killed and raped in the afternoon, and came home in time for dinner. That was the job of hundreds of thousands of Christian Rwandans for three months. The military was barely involved. One of the killers described it this way. Killing is very discouraging if you yourself must decide to do it, even to an animal. But if you must obey the orders of the authorities, if you have been properly prepared, if you feel yourself pushed and pulled, if you see that the killing will be total and without disastrous consequences for yourself, you feel soothed and reassured. You go off to it with no more worry. First they killed because they were afraid or they were angry. Then because they were encouraged to and couldn't stop. And finally, they killed because the only way to protect themselves was to have no survivors who could speak against them. They were only safe as long as they won and won completely. A million people fell to the machete that way. 
And there were moments of bravery. There were pastors who died with their people, Hutu who protected and hid the hunted, and towns that refused to kill anyone and sheltered all Tutsi in them from harm. But mostly, people were scared. And they kept their heads down. They avoided what they could. They did what they felt they had to do to survive. And so they killed. And they kept killing until early July, when the Tutsi RPF army finally took the capital of Kigali and threw out the Hutu government behind this genocide. And we have all of this on film. This happened in 1994, well within living memory. As much as we would like to pretend otherwise in this age of citizen journalism, video cameras are not protection against genocide. Christianity is not protection against genocide. And it isn't something only armies and monsters do. We, individual people, have the capacity to kill when the circumstances are just wrong. And that should make all of us very, very uncomfortable. Next week, I'll look at why the people's faith failed to prevent the genocide, and then I'll look at what specific steps have to take place to create a genocide. But for now, thanks for watching. Have a great week. See you next video.